Welcome. Welcome to Brown Bag Lit. We are so happy to have you here. I'm Chloe Miller, the co-founder of Brown Bag Lit with Shasta Grant. And I wanted to start by sharing a little bit about Brown Bag Lit. We offer classes and readings as well as lots of other events like today's. And we hope you'll join us for a class or a reading. And through May, we're offering poetry classes on Tuesdays and pro prose classes on Thursdays. Both are at noon Eastern Standard Time. You can find all of our upcoming events on our website. And we're very excited that we just announced our brand new summer offering, calling it the Summer Residency. It's an asynchronous class that will last three months and you'll receive weekly prompts, one-on-one -on -one meetings with either myself for poetry or Shasta for prose, as well as personalized feedback in response to submissions. We'd love to have you join us. You can find all the details on our website, brownbaglit.com. Please note we have an early bird special price that ends on April 15th. Current students receive an even deeper discount if you're interested in taking a class before 415 to be eligible for that discount. And our next event is right after this one, starting at noon Eastern Standard Time, Family Albums, Writing About Loved Ones, another fake AWP event. It is a prose focused event with Shasta Grant, our co-founder who's also here, along with special guests, Diane Gottlieb and Pooja Makajani for our final fake AWP panel discussion for the day. Um, next Wednesday at noon, we're hosting a reading from Flash Fiction America, and like all of our events, this one's free. We'd love to have you join us. You can learn more on our website, which Shasta has put into the chat, brownbaglid.com. Follow us on social media. And now we are ready to start talking about today's event. Um, thank you so much for coming to Reading to Write Poetry. And we will be reading in alphabetical order. Each person will introduce the poet who comes after them. We'll be sharing their bios and links in the chat box. Please make sure if you can that you remain mute unless you are the poet speaking during the reading. I recommend that you watch our presentation on speaker view and then gallery view during the Q&A, which will be after the readings. Um, keep your chat box open. I hope that you'll share questions, things that you admire about the, po the poets. Um, you can follow along with the links for the poets. We'll be sharing all the speakers' bios and links in the chat. Remember that our readings are free. We are um, unfortunately unable to pay the poets at this time, but we hope that you will support them by purchasing their books and following them and attending their readings, either um, buy the books from them, their publishers, independent bookstores. Thank you each for coming. We really appreciate you being here on a Saturday morning. I think we're all naturally readers if we're writers, or at least I hope we all are. And we learn that the written word or the spoken word can invoke so many feelings or understanding in us. We learn about ourselves and others. As we're reading other people's work, we can start to set a tone or style or approach for our own writing practice. Some of us read the same books over and over. Others keep seeking out new work. Hopefully you learn about some new work here today. So we are going to be starting with Francis Klein. We'd like to welcome Francis Klein. You can unmute yourself and I look forward to hear, hearing what you have to say. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, like with a lot of virtual things, I will just tell you, if you hear the sound of pure joy in the background, my three-year-old is watching Sesame Street. Uh, so that's what that is. Um, I am going to uh, read and talk today about somebody that's probably not new to anybody, Terrence Hayes. Uh, but when I was thinking about authors that uh, make me want to write, he was the one that I came back to. So I'll put his website in, in the chat. But um, I'm going to be uh, talking about a poem from his book, Wind in a Box, which is uh, one of the first poetry books that I ever bought when I was sent to Powell's bookstore in Portland to get <clears throat> a bunch of poetry books for my first poetry course. Um, Wind in a Box was in there. And I'm going to um, read a little bit of there's just so much going on in every Terence Hayes poem. He's especially, especially his prose poetry is really dense. Um, and just with Terence Hayes's poetry, you never know what's coming in the next line. Everything is so unexpected and, and so fresh and original. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of uh, his prose poem, Everybody Goes to Heaven, um, which I has inspired just a lot of my own writing. Um, and then 
I'll read a poem of mine that I think is a direct descendant. <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, the Terence Hayes poem, Everybody Goes to Heaven. And I'll put a link to it in the chat in just a second. I just multitask. Um, everybody goes to heaven. The deceivers, each of them wringing their undersized hands and the unrepentant wearing snowshoes that leave question marks on the dirt road behind them. The insomniac gang from the ninth circle, the crew of bloodshot despots, the dictators rubbing their rope burns, a Judas for each hour of eternity. They all show up when the news gets out. Everybody goes to heaven. The doorman sees them coming and scratches the bald spot behind his ear, his mind drifting toward the next gig now that his job is done. The saints and zealots who had no lives beyond duty, the ones who whispered into the ears of folk like my parents, the converts, the most blind and love struck. They will spend their retirement painting sublime landscapes and portraits of their persecutors. And what becomes of the righteous, the ones who lived full uh, lives full of absolute faith and virtue? They picket, mope, or pace outside the open gates. You can imagine their outrage. Their version of heaven has become a ring of smoke. It has become a thing of the past, and the past has become all that's left. They are so full of the past, they cannot be changed now. They are so full of heaven, they cannot be filled. Um, it's one of my all-time favorites by him, although when I sat down, I knew I was going to talk about Terrence Hayes, and so I sat down with this book last night to thinking I would like look through and pick one, and then I ended up just rereading the entire book um, because it really is uh, so incredible. Um, <clears throat> and I think one of the things that I've found in my own writing is that I do think a lot and write a lot about religious like mythology and influence. Um, I think probably like a lot of former church attendees. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna read a poem of mine that I would say is probably a direct descendant of Everybody Goes to Heaven, um, which I actually found out last week. This is a poem that's gonna be in the South Florida Poetry Journal later, later this year. So I'm excited about that. Um, so this is my poem, What We Do After. When the word gets out that there is no God and the sky closes like a lid, we all go on much the same as before. The old churches continue to be converted into ramen lounges and spirit Halloweens. The most famous saints, still the ones with the glistening wet eggs of Super Bowl rings perched above their knuckles. We adjust to the way our prayers rebound, land shuddering at our feet like stunned starlings. We lived like there was no God when we thought there was one. But now that we know better, we go out of our way on the sidewalk to avoid crushing the line of black ants doggedly ferrying kernels of popcorn back to their hill. We keep extra bandages in our pockets to give to the children of strangers when they fall off their bikes. The bandages have characters on them from the cartoons we have continued to make even though there is no God. Cartoons where the frog and bear say harsh words at first, then come together in the final minutes to share a blanket while they take turns looking through their telescope at the empty star-filled sky. Um, yeah, hopefully, I mean, it's, maybe it's obvious to me, hopefully there's a <laughs> clear connection between those two. Um, but with that, I think, uh, I'm gonna pass it off to our next reader. So again, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Uh, and I am gonna pass this over to uh, Mike, to Mike Lewis Beck to talk to us next. Congratulations on your publication. I, they've been rejected, I've reject, been rejected about 10 times by that journal. I'm saying that out loud, so maybe someone will take pity on me. Uh, so uh, just a few, uh, few things. One thing I hope those people who are watching, if you haven't thought about signing up for Brown Bag Lit, you know, think about it. Um, okay, some poets that uh, have inspired me along the way are, well, Ted Kuzer is one. Ted Kuzer can take a porch swing and make it beautiful. And uh, Kim Adonizio, you know, she answered the question of why, uh, what women want. They want a red dress. 
And I, I just love that. And I, I used that in a poem of mine. I, I said I wanted men wanted red pants, or at least I did. Uh, and then Mary Rufel is another one who's uh, so so her she's so exotic and fine. Anyway, this particular poem that I'm uh, going to read is uh, and be inspired from is uh, Dylan Thomas. And um, one of the things I like is short poems. So uh, this is a short poem and I wrote a short poem about it. It's called, uh, okay, Simon, Simon Armitage, first of all, Simon Armitage, get his book short and sweet. It's about short poems. None of them are longer than 14 lines. Okay, so this is uh, mine, it's called On a Wedding Anniversary. The sky is torn across this ragged anniversary of two who moved for three years in tune down the long walks of their vows. Now their love lies a loss and love and his patience roar on a chain. From every true or crater carrying crowd, death strikes their house. Too late in the wrong rain, they come together whom, whom their love parted. The windows pour into their heart and the doors burn in their brain. So that's the poem and I read that and it was just so, just so sad. I, I loved it. And so I, my response is uh, entitled uh, Our Last Anniversary uh, After Dylan Thomas. The bed sheets are white hard as we sit on them in a last moment. We had three lyrical years between I thee wed and nameless dread. Like Kierkegaard, love left, wandering on a trembling journey with its heart beating fainter until it stopped at our cottage door. We stood too long in the snow, not rolling together into one ball. Instead, each of us, our own sculpture turned to ice carved by time. So I hope that made you all feel really sad. And, um, now I'm going to pass that to, and this is it's not based on my, it's not autobiographical, by the, way, well, by the way, at least so far. So now I'm going to pass this to, uh, let's see, John, uh, Jeff Lombardo. Jeff, it's all yours. I think to Nate Logan. Oh, it's, I, I made a mistake. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, thanks, Mike. Um, Thank you also Shasta and Chloe for uh, inviting me, having me here. Um, it's great to read with so many wonderful poets and um, for an audience this early in the morning, at least for me this early in the morning. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, form, which is something that I'm not really, um, I don't wanna say a fan of, but it's the only term I can think of to, to say that. Um, I was thinking um, after, well, after my first book was published um, about a former professor of mine who had told me, you should consider writing a book just of prose poems, because I had some prose poems in my book. And after the book was published, I kind of took that to heart. And for a few years now, I've just been writing prose poems. And um, if you're familiar with the prose poem, you might think, well, what's, you know, what's different about that form? I mean, it's just paragraphs, right? Um, but I did stumble across a poet a few years ago who also writes prose poems, but they are broken into sentences. And so I'm putting a link in the chat to the work of Leslie Lewis. Um, and I'm going to read one of her poems and then one of mine, and um, hopefully you'll be able to tell. And I'll hold the, the book up to the screen so you can see what I'm talking about here. Um, but in addition to writing the prose poems, um, she really is kind of echoed in some of what Francis and Mike was talking about. She takes like these little moments and kind of explodes them. So what might seem uh, banal is actually full of mystery kind of and a little bit of surrealism maybe so uh, this is called in the inn i didn't and didn't sleep 
I hung between random events and a linear life. Guests walked their dogs through the big room lobby. You told me the earth moves and I told you it all moves. Kids swished by in ski pants. Drinkers clink glasses in the bar. This adds up. It's like a robot of love, an old boyfriend. I mean, really old. The clerks talk sports. Then the director shoots himself. Mathematical proofs prove abstractions. And so hopefully I'll hold it up so you can see a little bit. That's how a lot of her poems are formatted. And so I've kind of taken, even though it's still prose, I've taken that form and kind of um, used it on my own. And so here's um, one poem that does that. Thank you very much, but no. You've brought me a one size fits all baseball helmet. It doesn't fit. Audience laughter falls where it should in a sad poem. Where does the time go? Between the couch cushions with the remote. I made several mistakes actually. So hopefully you can see kind of the, um, that connection between um, those two. And it's really, I would say if you haven't tried it or maybe you're philosophically opposed to the prose poem, which I know some people maybe still are. Um, it's interesting to try to see how much that kind of makes you think about just the power of the sentence, not the line break, not a word, but like the sentence itself and how those stacked on each other can um, affect a reading. So yeah, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure now to pass it off to Allison Lubar. Hello, everyone. Um, it is, it's so early in Seattle. Thanks for uh, setting that alarm. Um, so I'm going to read one poem that really influenced me and then two short ones of my own. And I approached this, uh, this task as, as um, a student, because the poem that I chose is one that I remember reading in 10th grade English. And now as a high school English teacher, um, thinking about the impact that this has even had so many, 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 many years later. Um, and uh, so the poem that I'm going to read to you that was a big influence um, on me is To Be in Love by Gwendolyn Brooks. And something that I just, I think this poem was so earth shattering for me um, because of the precision of language and the precision of the images that she offers. Sorry, let's get this here. All right, to be in love. To be in love is to touch with a lighter hand. In yourself, you stretch, you are well. You look at things through his eyes. A cardinal is red, a sky is blue. Suddenly, you know he knows too. He is not there, but you know you are tasting together the winter or a light spring weather. His hand to take your hand is over much, too much to bear. You cannot look in his eyes because your pulse must not say what must not be said. When he shuts a door, is not there. Your arms are water, and you are free with a ghastly freedom. You are the beautiful half of a golden hurt. You remember and covet his mouth to touch, to whisper on. Oh, when to declare is certain death. Oh, when to apprise is to mesmerize, to see fall down the column of gold into the commonest ash. Um, that's just always been one of my favorite pieces. And, and I took the last two lines of it as an epigraph for my debut, um, chapbook, which is called philosophers know nothing about love. And it kind of traces, or it uses the elements of, um, the allegory of the cave, Plato's allegory of the cave. Um, but I, I think I'm always trying to move towards precision with 
uh, with imagery and if it's okay, if it's a bird, what kind of bird and what is the bird doing and where is it and really filling in those precise images with the idea or the, the idea that I think in poetry, especially the more specific you are, um, the more universal it, it ends up being. Um, so this is me and I think I'll just read one. Um, this is called Cosmology 33 and there are seven tiny parts. One, weaving prophecy. You pull me back into myself, phantom mending golden filament, vision revised through Delphic swirls of melted ice in rye within the curled rims of paper coffee cups. Two, summer arbor, transforms new and foreign, my every petal shivers, even leaves mistake you in moonlight for sun. Three, Open as a letter, tulip, porch door, the row between chorus girls, the space between trees and stars. Four, quotidian knowing where your sneakers wear out, your Sunday afternoon self, milk to cereal ratio. This is how I will treat the symptoms measured in slotted spoons. Five, a stranger. Once, when this almost happened, like the P. Noir awaiting his execution, I felt ready to live it all again. Six, tragic marginalia. When will you slip to the periphery, surrender to an end note? How will I survive the scatter of cells, syllables? How will I survive this dispersion, the soul's diaspora? Seven, new ontology. I believe in concrete geometry over destructive mythologies, the intersection of two lines, not on a flat graph, but rather a sphere, fated to meet each year, two points of contact, numerically distinct, equidistant and infinite collision. The earth is good for this. Thank you. Um, and it is my absolute joy and honor to pass this on to Chloe Miller. Thank you. Thank you. It was so beautiful. I think the ending was this earth deserves this. I really like that. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about Jane Hirschfield, who I really have always loved. This is a poem from her book, The Lives of the Heart. And the poem is Da Capo. If you've taken a class with me, I've probably presented this poem because I love it very much. Um, I really admire how she takes our world and food and brings it back to, to us and our heart and things that we might be thinking about. And this is Da Capo by Jane Hirschfield. Take the used up heart like a pebble and throw it far out. Soon there is nothing. Soon the last ripple exhausts itself in the weeds. Returning home, slice carrots, onions, celery. Glaze them in oil before adding the lentils, water, and herbs. Then the roasted chestnuts, a little pepper, the salt. Finish with goat cheese and parsley. Eat. You may do this, I tell you. It is permitted. Begin again the story of your life. Um, I really, I like also how the last line sounds a lot like Rilke's poem from the torso, uh, archaic torso of Apollo that ends, you must change your life, the sense of urgency and possibility and permission. I've been thinking a lot about influences and while um, admittedly Shasta and I came up with this title of who poets are reading, thinking about our influences, but I think it often expands beyond that. Um, Joan Murrow's titles from his abstract art, I really enjoy how they give narrative and definition to pieces that are really abstract. And this kind of line between humans creating art, nature creating art, and this intersection of where we live with the light and the shadows and what we're looking for. Um, so I wanted to read a poem from my collection, Viable, which came out from Lily Poetry Review Books in 2021. It's a lyric memoir about a miscarriage and postpartum depression following a second pregnancy. 
and this poem Figs um, was first published in Literary M Mama online. And I think you'll hear some reverberations with Jane Hirschfield's Doc Couple. Figs, unwrapped winter fig tree, seemingly dead or dormant. How long to be sure? Removal of what was, could have been, and other compound tenses, like future, will. And I wanted to mention two other books and then read another poem. Meg, this is prose, but Megan O'Rourke's The Long Goodbye is about the loss of her mother. And she has an amazing collection of resources at the end as she turns towards literature and philosophy and science, thinking about loss and grief. And I tried to do the same in Viable of putting together other books that help me both through the time and in the writing. And one book that Megan O'Rourke mentioned was Roland Barthes' The Morning Diaries, which he wrote a small piece every morning after, well, I don't know when he did, but every day after his mother died for the first year. And um, in this translation by Richard Howard, I think it's really, it's a beautiful, maybe prose poems like Nate was talking about, um, sense of, of loss and grief and that same, clarity and definition that Mar um, that we've been hearing about in, in our poems. So I wanted to read one last poem titled Carrying, which was published in All We Can Hold, a collection of motherhood, collection of poetry on motherhood from Sage Hill Press in 2016. And this poem started as I was slicing an avocado. It's in the second section from my second pregnancy. Um, and I think there are some kind of reverberations are mirroring with Jane Hirschfield. Carrying, advice. Slice the avocado around the wide middle and across again until the quarters split. Drop the pit in the trash, scoop the flesh with a spoon, but it's never that easy. Should I have pierced four toothpicks into the sides of the pit, balanced it halfway in water, waited for a sprout? Should I have willed life by that windowsill? Most miscarriages, aren't mama's fault, doctors say. No one says much else. Silent first trimester, breast and uterus bulge, strange hungers. So shrinking after removal, night sweats, repeated dream. Someone calls my name. I have hope inside of me is a Greek pregnancy euphemism. Funnel crowds, clouds trace the land as leaves flip in the wind. I stand in a basement doorway, emergency pack on my back. How do I know when it's over? No siren screamed when the doctor said, the fetus has no heartbeat. My legs in a stirrup, I couldn't rush to shelter. To be such a weak verb, to howl, to breathe, to linger, more viable. To be as in she is, she isn't, she was, she wasn't. State of being irregular. Carriage, someone behind the curtains. Such magic, miscarriage, the undoing avocado pit dry in the trash. So thank you. Next up we have Marceline White. Thank you so much. What a beautiful reading. Um, it's so great to be here with everyone. Um, again, I'm Marceline White. Uh, I was talking the other day just um, on my Facebook page that I'd had a couple of migraines. And so I was thinking about unruly bodies and how your body doesn't always do what you want it to do. And um, that term was coined in a Carterborough folklore and fairy tale um, class I took looking at, looking at how fairy tales talk about the body. Um, so for this reading, I thought I would talk a little bit and read some about unruly bodies. Um, I draw on archetypes and fairy tales as well as a lot of other sources, but I, I think they have a lot of power. Um, and so when I think about who inspires me or I think who I'm in conversation with or who I'd like to be in conversation with, um, one poem is A. Stallings and I'll put it in the, um, I'll put it in the chat, but it's Fairy Tale Logic um, by A. Stallings, Fairy Tale Logic. Fairy tales are full of impossible tasks. Gather the chin hairs of a man-eating goat, or cross a sulfuric lake in a leaky boat. 
Select the prints from a row of identical masks. Tiptoe up to a dragon where it basks and snatch its bone. Count dusk specks, moat by moat. Or learn the, or learn the phone dictionary by rote. Always it's impossible what someone asks. You have to fight magic with magic. You have to believe that you have something impossible up your sleeve. The language of snakes, perhaps, an invisible cloak, an army of ants at your back, or a legal, lethal joke. The will to do whatever must be done. Marry a monster, hand over your firstborn son. Um, and I love the way that they play with the tropes and the power. And even though it's rhymed, it doesn't feel um, too overdone um, because it's playing with it's playing with the sense of the sense of fairy tales that we know. And um, I think the power and the specificity of the images is is very powerful. So um, I am going to read a poem that I think is in conversation with that. Um, and it is called A Fairy Tale for My Son as His Celine Drip Infuses His Veins. We skipped the fairy tales when you were younger. Forget dead mothers, evil women others. Forget the dark woods, the big wolves, welcoming homes filled with overly large ovens. Forget hovels filled with young girls scouring in ashes. Forget red hoods, red lips, red shoes. Forget hair. Blonde, plated, raven's wing black. Forget talking animals, small men, enchantments, magic anything. Now I wish for magic everything, for magic anything. I wish you knew story tales on how to find your way home. Leave me a trail of breadcrumbs or blood drops. Leave the bits of yourself, your elf behind that you no longer need. Slip the pain off, doff the nausea like a seal skin. Become a selkie. Your body casts its own evil spells, no need for others. You cast yourself out as your body attacks itself. You stand, blood waterfalls to your feet, cursed red shoes. Three years transformed from prince to beast to my own sleeping beauty. For weeks, for months now, for years you sleep. Your skin white as snow, your hair a crown of gold. Where's my wish for you? Protection, yes, this no. I wish seven dwarves would hi-ho themselves through your veins, mining your ever forever collapsing vessels. I find potions to ply you with. Mumble medical journal articles like incantations, consult oracles, specialists, the interwebs to unlock the secret, to release you from this thicket of pain as your body attacks itself. I wish for you a kiss for you that could rouse you, wake you, set things right. Move us from this place of suspended animation to a happily ever after. Thanks.